Neom360 Google Plus Hangout on Air, Working with Shelters, a special online event designed to help private veterinarians and shelters find collaboration in their communities. I'm Christy Reimer, editor of DVM360 Magazine. Today, with me to explore the topic of working with shelters are Dr. Jeff Werber, a private practitioner in the Los Angeles area, and Dr. Jed Rogers, formerly a private practitioner and now senior vice president with the ASPCA. So let's get started. Throughout the Hangout, if you're watching with us live today, feel free to submit questions. You can use the comment feature in Google Plus or YouTube or the built-in Q&A feature in Google Plus. So first off, I wonder if you could each talk for a few minutes about your own journey down the path of working with shelters and rescue organizations as veterinarians. Where are you at now and how did you get there? Jed, let's go ahead and start with you. Thanks, Christy. I appreciate you inviting me to join this Google Hangout, my first Google Hangout, by the way, that I participated in. Um, so I started out uh, as a private practitioner in Hawaii. I was there for six years, uh, moved to the Denver area, and during that time um, owned and operated uh, 10 veterinary hospitals. Um, most recently owned a group of six hospitals in Denver that I sold to VCA back in 2010. Throughout that entire private practice career, I worked with um, local animal welfare organizations, shelters, rescue groups, um, TNR groups, that sort of thing, in various capacities, and also with uh, veterinary associations. I was president of the HVMA when I was in Hawaii and president of the Colorado VMA when I was here in Denver, among other things. Um, and back in uh, 2012, I took the position with the ASPCA as senior vice president of the Animal Health Services. So. In that capacity, I oversee uh, some fairly large veterinary programs. We have an animal hospital on the Upper East Side of uh, New York City, Manhattan, um, spay neuter operations. We do about 40,000 spay neuter surgeries in New York uh, and starting this year in LA. And then the Animal Poison Control Center, which uh, a lot of veterinarians know and love. So um, that is my brief history. Great. Jeff? Tell us how, uh, where you're at now and how this, uh, what this journey has been like for you. Well, I started uh, practicing back in uh, 84, and I was working for a veterinarian whom I worked with as a technician before veterinary school. And um, after working together, I, I think our great engagement never turned into a marriage, so we, uh, I, I, uh, I left. And, of course, as a uh, starting practice from scratch, I did not buy a practice. Being very nervous about, okay, I need to, A, see patients. And how am I going to how am I going to get patients? Well, we actually had Jed would like to hear this. We had an ASPCA on West Jefferson here in Los Angeles. I mean, literally a stone's throw from my office. I said, you know what? I'm going to go over there and let's see if they need any help. Let me send my technicians. Let's teach them, oh, you know, even simple things like handling and giving injections. Because you know, as we know, most of these um, shelters and rescue organizations are are really being run by volunteers. So uh, I thought if we can lend a helping hand, that would be great. Now, I know at the time, and it might be still the case, that shelters weren't allowed to actually recommend a veterinarian. And as members of the Southern California Veterinary Medical Association, all of us had to give free exams to new adopt you know, adoptees. But I figured if I could get a little plug in there just by having been helping them, it might be to our benefit, not to mention we were so close. And sure enough, it started working well. We were getting a lot of referrals. And as a, a, a new doctor with his own practice and a lot of bills to pay, we want referrals. So uh, it was working very well. And I really started liking and enjoying the fact um, that we were doing this. And what I found most interestingly is that clients love to know that their doctor is working with and helping these shelter animals, these rescue animals, started to snowball. And as my practice grew, and my location grew, and I have a, a much larger facility now. Uh, we have opened up, obviously, not to just uh, shelters, but also we work with a lot of rescue groups. And you know, there are good and bad working with rescue groups and shelters. Um, oftentimes, we are handcuffed as far as what we can spend, what we can do. Uh, we have, obviously, different pricing. We have uh, very demanding people that want to ser service now, even though they're not paying for the full service now. Um, but we sort of uh, sort of had a, the meeting of the minds, uh, uh, and we it, it really turned into a great place for us. So currently, uh, in addition to the shelter work that we do, uh, we probably work with about six major rescue groups. Um, I'm on the board of two of them. Uh, we get a lot of referrals. We are the go-to. 
and hopefully that if a uh, uh, one of them actually, well, two of them, all adopters um, have to bring their pets to us for that first exam. And whether or not they're um, geographically desirable or not, they at least come once. And our job as a care for hopefully give them a really good experience, and many of them do not have veterinarians, and often what happens is they actually have other pets, they have other veterinarians, but if you play your game right, you play your cards right, you treat them well, show them that you care, which is, you know, I always say one of my favorite lines is, people really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And one, a great way to show caring is to help these animals in need. Jeff, that's that's awesome, and I think there are a lot of veterinarians out there out there like you who have you know found ways to make this relationship work. But here at DVM 360, we get a lot of um, we hear a lot of the angst that's going on among the private practitioner community um, who see these shelters as competition for uh, veterinary services. Um, so, Jeff, in your experience, what is the biggest sticking point between veterinarians and the shelter nonprofit community? In your experience and ob observation. Well, you know, first of all, to us, I don't see that as a competition. You know, let's face it, the two um, uh, factors that what one might compete the most from a shelter, and I'd love to hear, you know, Jed's viewpoint on this too, is vaccine and spay neuter. Well, what we did is if you can't beat them, join them. Our clients, and I can tell this to anybody, would rather have you provide the care. So I would say to that veterinarian, why don't you provide or offer a vaccine clinic? Make it one day a week, one evening. And those clients that really need to save that money, and even if you charge two dollars more than the shelter, they're still going to come to you. You're not going to go someplace for two bucks, and they're more comfortable with you anyway. They know you, they know your staff. You're giving the injection. Um, it's just I've, I've never seen that as a problem. As far as spay neuter, you know, I it's like I would say I always use it. I, I break it down to the car model. You know, if you want the Rolls Royce or the Bentley or the the the, the, the Mercedes Benz of treatment then that's what we provide. Um, if you're happy with the Chevrolet or the Pontiac, then then maybe that's where you should go. But understand, you're not comparing apples to apples. If you want to compare apples to apples, are they using laser? Are they doing pre-operative pain man uh, post-operative pain management, pre-operative blood work? Are the animals on, on fluids during the procedure? All these things that as veterinarians we should and need to be doing for the safety of our patients. And people have to know that they're just not going to get it there. And if they still want to make that choice, then that's okay. Now, what we do offer for our rescues and for the brand new adopters who are still under the contract with the rescue is we do have separate pricing for rescue spay neuter. And we are fairly com competitive, not nearly as competitive as some of these uh, low cost spay neuter clinics can provide, but we do provide more service. And it's a great way to keep these clients. So if we do it quickly, they, they work on our schedule. Um, we, you know, we, we, do we cut a few corners? Do we offer oral meds instead of injectable meds? Yes, but it's a way to keep these clients in the door. Okay, Jed, what what would you add to that? What do you see as the biggest sticking point, uh, or do you have anything to add to what Jeff has said? Yeah, I think that uh, I think Jeff hits it on the head, and I and I love the way that you address that, Jeff, in your practice because you know you found a way to collaborate. Um, and it's, uh, you know, collaboration is always easier than conflict, especially in this world that we're talking about. Um, and you know, finding ways that you can work with groups in your community. And collaboration doesn't mean that you work with everybody, and we're going to talk about that later. You find groups that you work with, that you're comfortable with, uh, up to your capacity in your practice. You don't have to do this for everybody. You find groups that you work with, and you find a way that that, that, that works for everybody. And it's, it's, a great, it's a great way to make the model work. And I agree. I think a lot of the angst, um, Christy, comes from this world of vaccines and spay neuter. And most of the animal welfare groups that are out there, there are some a few exceptions here and there, but most of those groups are doing those services um, not because they're making money off of them, not because uh, it's an easy thing for them to do. They're doing it because it helps them get the animals into a home. And, you know, it truly is related to mission, um, which ties exactly into what Jeff said. You know, clients aren't getting those services at an animal welfare organization because that's the place they want to get it. They're getting that at the animal welfare organization because that organization has chosen to do that to make the animals more adoptable. They would rather, the vast majority of people would rather come to a private veterinarian for care. And the vast majority of animal welfare organizations have a vested interest in seeing that their adopted animals 
get into a private veterinary situation where they're going to get lifelong care. Um, so I think there are more points of you know, collaboration and uh, more places where these communities see things the same way than places where they see things differently. I think we just hear about the places where there are conflict and there are lots and lots of places where collaboration is, is happening. Well, that kind of leads right into our next question. Let's talk a little bit about misperceptions. Um, so, Jeff, in your opinion, what's the biggest misperception the shelter and rescue community has about the private uh, practitioner community? Well, I think that they think we're, we're too overpriced, of course. Um, I don't think they necessarily get it. Oh, I think it's better. I really do. I agree with Jeff. I think it's, it's much better. And the, you know, I'll give you a funny story. I, uh, there was a spay and neuter clinic here in town, and when I opened, um, I had my, my fees, and I remember uh, years and years ago, one of the um, uh, vet econ board members had done a, 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 what does it truly cost a private practitioner to perform a, a spay or a neuter? I mean, we're talking hard cost, tech time, drug cost, anesthetic cost, you know, whatever it takes, whatever goes into it. Um, and it was at the time, this is years ago, it was something like 79 or 80 bucks, hard cost. So when, when, when these clinics are doing it for 75 dollars, you know, it's because they're obviously cutting corners somewhere. They're using the same pack for two or three surgeries at a time. They're using the same gowns. I mean, you know, let's face it, and, and they have to. I, I get it. And my job is to educate our clients as to the differences and let them make an, an informed decision based on those differences. So um, I had a, um, and I, look, I, for an AHA practice, uh, a vet econ award-winning uh, design practice, merit design award, so I, I, I know that we have to stay on the, on the sort of the upper range for my area. I'm not the highest. I'm certainly not the lowest. And you know, I had clients that really needed the, the help when it comes to spay and neuter. So there was a spay and neuter clinic down the road. And uh, this guy was amazing. He could do a, we should all learn from him how to do a spay. And uh, he would, he, I, I, I'd say, look, you know, I understand you can't afford our prices. It's not a problem, but it's so important to have your pet spayed and neutered, let me send you down to the spayed and neutered clinic. And I would send a lot of my clients there. And I sent them there with, with a lot of, 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 of confidence that they're coming back. I did not want them starting to go on the phone at the, at the time, the phone book. I know that's a, a, a novel concept now. There's no such thing as a phone book. But they to open the phone book, go into the, 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 the pages, look for veterinarians, and, and hunt for a veterinary hospital that was less expensive than we were. Why? Because if they went there for that less expensive spay neuter, they automatically would think that everything is less expensive and they are going to maybe consider switching. I send them to a spay neuter clinic or a low cost clinic or the ASPCA, they're not going to be there forever. They're just going to go there for their surgery and then they're coming back to me. So I get a call from this doctor. His name is Dr. Mackey, Marvin Mackey. And, and uh, he says, Jeff, hi, this is uh, Dr. Mackey over at the spay neuter. He goes, I'd like to get together with you for lunch sometime. And I said, sure, I, well, that's all fine with me. So we go meet for lunch. He tells me he's been practicing in Los Angeles before me for 25 years. I am the first veterinarian to actually refer business to them. And it set up a fantastic relationship because why? Because when he would have clients come in, he would hear them talking and he'd meet them and they were not enamored with their veterinarian. And guess who got referred? from the spay neuter clinic. So you talk about working together, it's the best thing in the world. That's great. Uh, that's great to hear and uh, thanks for kind of illustrating that with some of your personal experience. Um, so Jed, let's flip it. In your experience, what is the biggest misperception nonprofit groups have about veterinarians? Uh, I will answer that question, I promise, but I, I want to mentioned something about Jeff's story because it's such a, I mean, it's such a great story. I mean, I think that the theme here with Jeff is that that he has taken the time, the initiative, the effort you know, to get out in the community and, and establish these relationships, which I think is really the key. You know, to me, that's, that's the underlying theme in all of these discussions. Um, and then specifically with respect to you know, the cost of surgery, Jeff, you're absolutely right. I, you know, I, having owned and operated hospitals for a long time, it, we all know there's a certain cost there that, you know, if you're going below that cost, you're losing money. And some people choose to do that uh, consciously in order to, you know, keep that business in-house. The other piece of that puzzle, I think, is where you have 
nonprofit organizations like mine who provide spay neuter surgeries at or below cost, we have become much more careful about using terminology. Uh, we, we don't call those low cost pr pr procedures, we call them subsidized procedures. The only reason we can provide those <clears throat> at such a low price to the consumer is because we have generous donors who have entrusted us with funds to go and do this good work. And so then we need to speak about it in the right way because we don't want people in New York or LA thinking that, you know, um, eight bucks is the cost, is the price you should be paying for a spay neuter procedure. No, it's much higher than that. We're just lucky that we have donor dollars to defray the cost so that you don't have to pay as much. And I think there's power in the way that you speak about those things. Um, and so we, we try to be very careful about that. Uh, so back to the actual question, Christy, sorry, uh, is I think the biggest misconception amongst the, um, the animal welfare community when it comes to veterinarians is that veterinarians are not willing to help. Um, I, I think that's a big myth, and I think that there are a lot of animal welfare organizations out there who um, see that as a big barrier or allow it to interfere with their um, with their efforts. You know, if, if, if we all made the efforts that Jeff has made to uh, reach out into the community and form relationships that, that bear fruit over time, I think things would be so much better than they are right now. And, you know, I haven't met a single veterinarian in my career who doesn't do a lot of services, uh, either discounted or for free, uh, for their own clients, for clients in their community, for in the, in the community. We oftentimes don't talk about it. We don't, quantify it. We don't use it. We don't toot our own horns uh, on that subject. Uh, but we do a lot in our communities. And I think that uh, in welfare groups, um, you know, uh, I wish that wasn't a misperception because I think there are a lot more veterinarians out there willing to help. Um, and, and it's a good resource that sometimes doesn't get utilized in the way it should. Okay. Um, it seems like, uh, at least anecdotally, that more and more uh, shelters are offering uh, veterinary services, especially like we've talked about spays and neuters, but also some wellness services as well, to the general public without really any kind of proof of income-based need. Um, Jed, does this match your impression, and why do you think this is? Yeah, I think that there are situations like that. Um, and I know that there are groups um, around the country who have implemented that model. Uh, and I think the approach has been, you know, to incorporate veterinary services as a profit center to help fund the mission of an organization. Um, and this is a place where um, I'm, I'm going to start speaking uh, my own opinions. The ASPCA is, um, is, you know, obviously has lots of connections throughout the country with lots of different uh, veterinarian shelters, rescue groups. And this is a, an issue that we're um, grappling with right now, and, and uh, we, we're considering all sides of it. My, my personal opinion, and I don't mean to be uh, flippant here, but you know, for uh, if you're if you're going out to raise funds, um, you know, veterinary services is a really hard way to do it. You know, wh what I tell friends who are considering this is, you know, if you want to make a million dollars on veterinary services, well, you better have ten million dollars in revenue. You know, and, and $10 million of veterinary revenue is not easy to create. You know, I, I personally would rather go ask a bunch of people for a million bucks apiece rather than try and create that million bucks for the, a veterinary hospital. So my opinion is, you know, in the great world of fundraising, that veterinary hospitals are not a very effective tool for fundraising. That's my personal opinion. Uh, I also believe, and this is from some personal experience, not just at ASPCA, but from some other groups that I've been involved with, that when you get into the world, if you in a nonprofit setting, when you try to get into the world of for-profit veterinary medicine within a nonprofit setting, it almost always pulls you off mission. You know, your your mission as a nonprofit, usually in the animal welfare world, is to help um, animals who are in crisis, and usually that means helping people who are in crisis. And if you move away from that model and start to you know open yourself up to uh, you know, typical veterinary, you know, private veterinary hospital clients, it's a difficult, it's a difficult to manage those two. You know, the, the mission on, on the animal welfare or nonprofit side is different than the mission on the for-profit veterinary side, and it's, those two things are difficult to bring together, in my opinion. Okay. Oh. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add, you know, it's interesting how, uh, and I, I, I totally agree in how, how I, it, it doesn't concern me at all. Um, and for this reason, I, I think that when a practice starts out, um, I think, you know, 
it's the clients are coming to us based on whatever. It's, it's new, it, it's nice looking, it's location. But ultimately, a practice matures and the choice of the type of client base that we maintain is ours. We set the standard based on our practice philosophy, based on our services that we provide, based on the prices, etc. And so therefore, the type of client that I've built you know, to, to, to attract to my practice is not the same client that's looking for low-cost or subsidized services at a facility like uh, you know any kind of shelter facility. You know, it's funny. I was um, a, a friend of mine from high school is a big-time hand surgeon now, and um, you know, because of the state of medicine, as is, it is what it is. By the way, all of us veterinarians listening, we should be very happy that we are practicing veterinary medicine and not medicine, human medicine. And um, so I, uh, I, I had a question about something with my hand. And I went to see him, and I, it turns out that he is now doing the. He is working with insurance companies. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be more blunt. The ambulance chaser insurance companies. So, so I walk into his waiting room. And this guy, I mean, when I knew him years ago, when he first started practicing, he was very high end. I mean, he, and 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 he's a phenomenal surgeon. But it's tough to make a dollar in medicine. So he is doing this insurance work. And I walk in his waiting room. There must have been 30 people in the waiting room. Clearly, clearly not the type of client that I want sitting in my waiting room. So it certainly attracts a certain type. And that's great. And for those, we need those services. We need that care. Because every pet deserves to have veterinary care and the best that can be afforded. So, I think that when if I hear that that they want to, these 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 facilities want to open up and start providing veterinary care, fantastic! I'm not worried about my clients going there because they won't step foot in there, and that's sort of the difference. So I think it really depends on how we educate our clients to the difference in services that we provide, to the difference of the equipment that we have, and they're going to be totally fine staying there. Great, great, excellent. Um, Jeff, I wonder if we could go back a little bit to um, your how, what you mentioned earlier about identifying certain rescue groups that you've uh, uh, decided to work with. How, what was your process like for deciding who are you were going to work with, and also how many of those um, people become long-term clients at your practice? Yeah. You know, so first of all, I would say it's very mutual. That that, and it's it's very clear. You talk to any veterinarian who's done it, who's tried it, who is currently doing it. In fact, if I were to mention certain names of rescue group people to the other rescue groups that I work with, they are going to have the same reaction that I would have. So certain groups have developed a reputation. Certain groups have developed a, a, um, uh, a, a personality traits that are unbecoming. And it's really nice when you're doing the work that we do. The, 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 the most important thing obviously patient care, helping these animals, but we want to be appreciated. You know, it's really nice when you're going out of your way to help somebody, you're going to break even at best. You're going to make it, maybe make a few dollars, but we're not doing it for that reason. We're doing it to help these animals and hopefully ultimately to build client base. So at the very least, appreciate us. And when they become too demanding, when you allow them, you know, give an inch, take a mile, when they, you, know, you, you, you allow them the opportunity to pay me next week, and then next week turns into two weeks, and then to two months, and then to six months, and then when you just call them and say, hey, guys, it's been a while. We, I, I hate to say no to your, the people you send us, but we may have to. Then they start getting mad at you. That's a person we don't want to work with. So, And it's very clear. So the, the groups that we keep now, and I said, we have about five or six, and interestingly, talk about the importance of the doctor, not necessarily the facility, is that one of um, a group that I used to work with a long time ago, oh, look, we're a busy practice. Um, they kind of went to maybe using us 20% and went someone else for 80%. It was all amicable. And I said, look, if you need us, we're here for you, whatever. And it became more of a location thing. Yes, the doctor they were working with left. Where did he go? To me. So now I have about three or four new rescue groups that were working with him and now they're all coming to us. So it just shows the importance of to maintain those relationships. I said, don't burn bridges unless you really want to. Keep your nose clean, and it's only going to help. So 
there is, I'd say, as far as numbers of clients, it really boils down, it boils down to a number of factors. Location is obviously they have to be geographically desirable. Um, if I keep 50%, I'm thrilled. All right, great. J uh, Jed, anything that you want to chime in on there? Sure. Um, you know, I think I think a big part of the equation when it comes to veterinary practice is working with um, animal organizations in their community is clear expectations on both sides. Uh, you know, what? How's it going to work? Um, how, how many patients? Is there a dollar limit? What kind of services? All those things need to be discussed fairly thoroughly. And to do that, you need a relationship. You know, you need to de de develop a relationship over time. You need to have some face-to-face -face and uh, some real detail, you know, figured out around those relationships so that everybody is um, happy long term. And, and it has to be done within the uh, the limitations of, of both the veterinary hospital and the, the animal organization. Everybody has to be comfortable with where that starts if you want it to last long term. Um, I. <laughs> As uh, Jeff was talking, and then you were, you were saying 50% you're happy with, Jeff. I, I remember a meeting I was at here in Denver when I first moved here um, 15 years ago, talking about the um, free first exam program. And Denver has a very strong program, uh, well, you know, well utilized, and uh, lots of veterinarians participate in that. And I remember talking to a veterinarian who was frustrated because um, the estimate at that point was that only um, seven out of the ten, you know, free veterinary exam clients who came in actually remained clients. And I kind of, I, at that time, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, well, that sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, well, so where do you sign me up? I want to sign up for this thing. And, and yet this practitioner was looking at it as he was frustrated that he had to give those three exams out of ten and he never saw the clients again. Well, you know, seven, you know, seven lifetime client the value of that for he had a hundred bucks that he had to pay to put his name in the book. Oh my God, you know it's it's uh, it's a pretty good business equation. Okay. I, I agree, and I totally agree. Also, uh, Jed, that we need to set out the ground rules at the beginning to avoid conflict uh, down the road. Um, but you know, I, you know, overall, it's it's been a trip. And I want to thing also do, and I and I like to cheat. I think right now um, the internet plays a major role in people's attitudes. You know, I, you know, I look at kids nowadays where we're asking about something, about a product or about a, a service provider, a restaurant, and, I mean, there, there's, it's, it's a knee-jerk reflex. Out comes the phone, you know, they, and they're already punching in. They'll give you an answer in two seconds. <laughs> so I am not proud when it comes to these things, and we, we always ask um, that because of the work we're doing, because of the help we're providing you, we ask these rescue organizations, these welfare agencies, Promote us. Just put a little blog about how happy what we did. You know, save Dr. Werber, Century Veterinary Group, whatever, saved this dog, and show pictures. People love to see that. And if they're not doing it on their own, ask them to do it. You may as well take advantage. You are giving up a lot as a veterinarian, as a doctor, as a practitioner to help these rescue agencies, and you need to be rewarded. And it's not only coming from obviously the financial aspect, coming from that agency. So it's the it's the, our reward of the clients that stay, and it's the other clients that see all the good work that we do that think about, consider switching their providers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I've seen a lot of practices recently who, even though they're uncomfortable doing you know, a press release or you know, doing something um, over the top that talks about their work with, in the animal welfare community, um, they are comfortable, you know, posting those things on, um, you know, Facebook or, or Twitter or Google Plus, and and then asking the social media folks at these groups, hey, you know, if we if we tweet something, retweet it, or you know, share you know, share our Facebook posts with your with your network. I mean, they're uh, one of the great things about a lot of these groups is uh, they have a lot of followers and they have a lot of people who are interested in their work and. If you can get access to that social media stream, why not? I mean, that's not why you do it. I think Jeff, you mentioned that before. You do it because you you're, you want to be uh, a valuable part of your community. I mean, ultimately, every veterinary hospital, no matter how big it is, is part of a small community. With you know, maybe within a larger community, but you want to do the right thing for the community. If if it helps you get business and develop your client base over time, that's great. Uh, and you shouldn't feel embarrassed about uh, leveraging it for that. Um, it's, I think that's part of the, the, the relationship. 
That makes me think that uh, that would be a great opportunity for team members to get involved, especially on the social media side of things. They're often a lot more um, open to that kind of thing than, than the veterinarians. Is that something, for, a question for both of you, something that team members could kind of take a role in, or are there other ways that they could help forge these connections? Well, I, I totally agree with you, Christy, that, that our team members do get involved, and I like them sharing stories with their circle of friends on Facebook when we saw a difficult case, when we had a, uh, a dog came in from one of the rescue agencies. It was literally mauled. His name was Henry. Henry was all over the internet. We have pictures. We're talking a dog whose trachea was 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 literally chewed through. We had to sew the trachea back together. And uh, over time, the, the the skin defect, the infection, the the granulation bed. We took we took sequential pictures along the way. And now Henry's in a happy home. So um, it is. A, yes. So the the, the key is. Your staff should be and, and should want to do it because they're great stories to share. People love to hear these feel-good stories, and um, it, it only it, it helps us and it helps position us as people that really care about the animals that we see and treat. Yeah, and I I agree. I think there's nothing nothing better than to involve the staff in that because they're the ones who uh, you know who took care of those animals and they should be proud of the work that they did. Um, and and the other thing, the only thing I'll add to that is that I know, you know, it's all going to be done within the context of the social media rules on both sides. Sometimes you're dealing with, you know, client-owned animals that uh, you need to make sure the clients are okay with you sharing that information. And sometimes with animal welfare organizations, if they do investigations, there's some sensitivities around sharing that info. But, you know, as long as you take care of those details, uh, to me, the more the better. I mean, I think, you know, spreading those stories... Who doesn't love a great animal story? You know, everybody does. Okay, shifting gears a little bit. Um, Jed, in past conversations, you have talked to me about <laughs> who are private practitioners who call you to complain about nonprofit veterinary work going on in their communities. And you have a very specific suggestion for those people. Can you tell us what that is and what the results have been? Yes. So my my, uh, I, I'm not going to curse on even on Google Hangout, but my smart Alec answer to that is, you know, that the you know whenever I have friends who complain about that, and I know there are a lot of veterinarians who who feel like animal welfare organizations um, sort of duck behind the mission. You know, it's all mission related, so we can do whatever we want. But to to a large extent, um, animal welfare organizations, nonprofits are driven by mission, and they have something that they are trying to accomplish, and a lot of a lot of animal welfare organizations are trying to, um, you know, get animals into homes, into lifelong homes. And so my recommendation for my friends who are frustrated is you know, pick the open admission shelter in your community and then go there and do euthanasia for a day. And, um, you know, I, I've only had um, two people take me up on that in 20 years, but I've done it in, in multiple cities, and it is, um, it's a sobering experience. You know, it really brings you right back to the reality of what these folks are dealing with every day. And you know, to me, there's no more courageous person than, than somebody who works in an open admission shelter because they are tasked with the community issue of unwanted animals. And it always, I always hate when people talk about, you know, shelters euthanizing animals. That, you know, shelter may perform the use of the euthanasia, but that's those are communities that are euthanizing animals, and it's a community issue. And to me, the community is much bigger than the shelter. And um, and so, yeah, that's that's my standard line. Um, most people who know me have heard it enough that they kind of they, their eyes glaze over, or they roll their eyes when I when I bring that story up. But that's that's my go-to request for them when they bitch. And you've had some people take you up on that, right? I've had two people take me up on it. And um, both of those people um, came back after the experience and thanked me, number one, um, and then told me about their experience. Usually, uh, you know, the, one of them never cries. <laughs> the other one was in tears. And um, it, was, you know, it was a profoundly impactful experience for both of those people. And, and not that that's, you know, you, you can't boil what we're talking about down to one experience. Um, and at the same time, I think that's a pretty powerful experience to have to help private practice veterinarians understand what these animal welfare groups and all the people, not just the veterinarians, but all the people who work for animal welfare groups have to grapple with the issue of euthanasia. You know, even no-kill groups have to grapple with the issue of uh, euthanasia and animal death, and it's not easy for anybody. Jeff, anything to add to that? 
Well, I mean, if they were to ask me, um, and I think Jed made the point earlier, I would, I would certainly uh, promote the idea. I do because I, I do it myself. Um, but I would let them know that if you are considering this, and if you're a new practitioner, and you're and you're looking for obviously something to do well for the community, um, something to help build your practice, um, go out there and let the rescue world know that you're available. Uh, but the ground rules are probably the most important. I'd say most of the issues that we've had with the, 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 the unsuccessful relationships have been we didn't lay the ground rules down clearly enough. Um, and, you know, let's put, you know, I understand their position and the position of a shelter, welfare organization. The budgets aren't always there. And they look to cut corners and they look for anything they can do to get something for nothing. Um, I know their rationale is they're doing it on behalf of the, of the animals that they're trying to save. Another thing that, that I, I want to mention, and, and, and I think that, that we as veterinarians have to, to pick a, a harder line approach, and that is the following. The, volunteer, the people that get into rescue work are also not really doing it for the money. All right? So, so they have what I refer to as the bleeding heart, which is great. We should all have bleeding hearts. Anyone who works with animals, veterinarians should have bleeding hearts. And that's why those of us that do that work with these groups, it's, it's because of that. However, when you look at the number, depending on the city, depending on the, 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 the municipalities and their own um, rules and regulations, there are, is a limited number of space in these shelters. And I am always trying to prevent my rescue groups from going in and adopting and pulling out these animals that are going to be relatively unadoptable, or that need a lot of medical care, a lot of work to put them back together just to get them to the point of being adopted. Often these animals are on the older side, and in the place of that one animal and the money that's going to be spent on that one animal, there might be 30 more that are ready to be adopted tomorrow in perfect health that you're going to get let languish and ultimately be destroyed while you're trying to save the one. If you're going to work in this industry, I believe, as tough as it is and as hard as it sounds, we have to adopt a herd health mentality, which is where we have to sacrifice the few for the benefit of the many. And it's the hardest lesson that I have to work with when I talk to these people. It's like, why are you doing this? You're, you're going to spend $1,000 on a dog that is probably not even get adopted or might die anyway. And you know how many animals we can pull out today for $1,000? So that's my difficulty. Um, I get to sit on it because I'm here and Google hang out with you guys. But I would like to make sure, and I, you're curious, Dad, what do you think about this? Yeah, you know, Jeff, I think the, the, uh, the concept of how you apply resources uh, to you know, animals that are uh, in need of homes is something that a lot of um, the shelters, rescue groups, other animal organizations grapple with daily. What, what, where I think there's significant value, again, this is, I mean, I'm sounding like a broken record here, but Jeff, you have a good enough relationship with the groups that you work with that you can have that frank conversation with them and be their advisor and, and be able to say, hey, this is this is what this is going to cost. We, we can go down this path and Here's what's going to cost. Here's what it's going to cost to get this this animal to an adoptable point. Uh, there's some significant care after that. Is this really the best use of resources here? And so you can at least inject um, some reality into that equation, so that the groups that you work with can make the educated decisions. Now, you know, unless you're running the group, you, you don't get to make that decision. But you have a huge amount of influence, and I think um, that's that's a great role for veterinarians. We can be constructive in that uh, argument and discussion as well. Um, you know, shelters across the country make those decisions every day, and um, you know, there there thankfully there are a lot of big cities that have uh, significant success that are much better off than they were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. There are some places where the live release rate, even in large communities, is in the 80 and 90 percent range, which I, you know, I still find incredible, and I've, you know, I've only been doing this for for 20 years, but you still have to make hard decisions, and I think when you have to make hard decisions, doing that with as much information and data and reality as you can is a valuable thing, and veterinarians can be a, a great part of that discussion. So, um, 
either of you, I guess we'll start with Jeff. Do you think that um, refusing uh, to collaborate with shelters or even directly opposing them in a local community uh, hurts veterinarians? And if so, how and why? Um, I, I definitely do think it hurts because, you know, it's, it's, you go online and you hear stories that have been in the media lately and you hear the negative aspects of, of private practice, at least veterinary medicine, how we are, you know, in it for the money, we really don't care, um, and uh, we, we gouge people uh, because we can. And uh, I think that the relationships that you build with these organizations shows that, no, 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 that's not true. We, we charge what we do because we have to maintain our facilities and our equipment and our staff, and we have to pay them well so they continue to want to work. Um, and, and let's face it, you know, I, I look at the cost of running a business, and Ted mentioned earlier, I guarantee back when you owned your practices, you would have been thrilled with the net dollars. Um, whereas now, you see that net dropping and dropping and dropping because the cost of providing services goes up. And we cannot, in our fees, keep up with that, um, that rise. So it's not true that, that we're out there just for the money. And I think that working with these agencies and shelters is what's going to help show the public now, wait a second, time out. We are here because we care. And we care about these animals, we care about their welfare, we, we want to do what we can to help. And it, it, obviously it's got to be in reason. We are not subsidized. We are not a nonprofit, and therefore we can't do it for free or for as low as some of these other places can, but we do what we can do. So I think it does give the wrong impression when a veterinarian says, no, 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 I'm not going to, I'm not going to work with you, blanket statement. Now, if you have a discussion with them and say, we've tried this before, here is how and why we failed. We would love to do this, but this is what we really need to, to lay out and to prevent that failure again, then we would be willing to revisit and reevaluate. So I think that's what it boils down to. Okay. Judd, do you have, is this something that you have seen in your experience of, um, veterinarians actually hurting themselves by directly taking on the shelter community? Yes. <laughs> and that, you know, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have grown up as a veterinarian in Honolulu, which is a, a good community that has uh, fairly good relationships. And then uh, I, I happen to come to Denver, which is uh, exemplary in terms of the way that veterinarians and, and the larger animal welfare community work together. But um, yeah, you see examples of it in lots of places. And it's unfortunate. I think that it's uh, it's not helpful for the veterinary community to get sideways with uh, with the animal welfare, welfare community. I think it's it's harmful to the veterinary community, honestly. And I think it when that happens, <coughs> excuse me, when that happens, I think it's easy for the public to jump to the place that Jeff was just saying. You know, oh, it's greedy veterinarians gouging the public, that kind of stuff. You know, whereas if you can tell a great story like Jeff can on an individual practice basis, hey, you know, we work with this shelter and these five rescue groups in a deep, meaningful way, or as a community, as a veterinary community, you can say we do these four things to help and support our animal welfare organizations in our community, it's much, much better. Um, and, you know, short of that, at least being neutral, you know, there are situations where, um, you know, it's just not going to work. And, and I think, you know, if, if a, a veterinarian in a community um, just can't work with their local animal welfare organization despite many, many attempts, then you can at least be neutral and, uh, you know, live and let live and do your own thing, focus on what you can do and let them focus on what they're doing. But, you know, there's no reason to get sideways and, and cause a PR nightmare. Right. A couple places around the country where that's happening right now, and it's just, I, I feel bad for everybody in those communities because it's just, it's, you know, it, it creates ill will. Right, right. Okay, just a quick reminder to our live audience. Um, if you have a question and you'd like to submit it, um, there are a couple ways you can do that. On Google+, Plus, just press the Q&A icon and then type your question on the right side of your screen. If you're watching on YouTube, you can just add a comment right at the bottom of the page, and we'll get to that Q&A time in a little bit. Um, so we've talked a lot about kind of the way things ha can really work optimally, but are there anything, and are there any other best practices that we should talk to our audience about um, showing that showcase how a private practitioner and a shelter or rescue rescue group can work hand in hand? Either of you can jump in. Well, you know, I, I think we covered you know most of it um, in the sense that 
it is, first of all, let, let the rescue groups know that you're willing and, and able and available. Uh, set the ground rules, and, and again, I've talked to some veterinarians that say, okay, for any given rescue group, we can offer up to five runs or five cages. Um, you know, just having, having a set number, when to pay. We used to, we used to settle up, if you will, once a month. Now we try to do it every Friday. We keep a credit card on file. Um, they get to re we send them the bill Thursday evening. They get to review it. Uh, we talk about whatever was supposed to be done at a discount and maybe wasn't, or more of a discount or less of a discount, whatever. And then once they get the approval, it goes in. So I think I think we it, we still run a business here. We have to we have to keep those things in mind. Um, but I will tell you, you meet really great people. I was just at a big event for one of the groups that we work with. Uh, they had their annual fundraising event. I'm on their board. Um, they, they, you know, I was I was up on the big screen. So, so other people, it's it really is, I, and I and I can't tell you enough. It it really you, you can use it to your advantage to promote the work that you do. People who who see what you do. I have one of my better clients, and I'm here in L.A. in Hollywood. Uh, definitely a Hollywood figure that I actually met at one such event, and now I take care of their five pets. So. It is. It definitely works, and and people love when they see what you do on behalf of the animals, and they hear the relationship you have with these groups. They it just it, they get excited and they they want a piece of it. So um, I, my, I my encouragement would be to do it if you haven't. If they, if it's been unsuccessful, try it again, but change the rules to make it work for you. Um, but I think the relationships are important to maintain. Yeah, and I what Jeff said, Jeff, what you said at the very end there, I think resonates with me in a big way. That you know, this I, I, the recommendations I always make either to animal welfare organizations or veterinarians, most of the time both, <laughs> as they're getting involved in these kinds of things, are one, <clears throat> this is not a small undertaking. You know, this is a significant effort, and you should treat it as such. You need you need a plan. You need to you know, dedicate some resources, time, you know, it usually doesn't take a lot of money, but time, money, um, to uh, to get the relationships going and to maintain them. And then the other thing is you have to have patience. I mean, I think that oftentimes these you know, veterinarians and animal welfare organizations come together and, you know, have, have a lot of different languages or they're, they're going after different goals and it takes a um, to work through those issues. And so, you know, I, I hear from veterinarians a lot and animal welfare organizations who say, you know, I, I I emailed that person, they never got back to me. I called them, left a message, they never got back to me. Well, don't give up after one try, <laughs> you know? Put a little more, more effort into it. And, uh, you know, it, it may take a little while, it may take longer than you think, you may not end up with exactly the relationship that you wanted, but as long as you end up with something that works for you, um, and that has to be maintained and reviewed uh, over time so that it's working for everybody. But as long as you end up with something that's working for you, like Jeff said, it can be a great thing. It, it leads to all these unexpected things uh, in addition to you know, the things that you expect out of the relationship. Sometimes you get some great unexpected benefits like your Hollywood client, Jeff. So the themes that I hear are persistence, managing expectations, and lots of communication. Absolutely, those are, uh, and they're all, I think, if you, if you learn from others' mistakes, I mean, it's always great to ask them, who have you worked with in the past? What didn't work? And that way, because, you know, very few of these rescue groups have never seen a veterinarian before. So they've worked with someplace, and what amazes me is how few veterinarians are now willing to work because of their bad experiences, uh, or they say, oh yeah, I used with them. They used to give us a 10% a discount. You know, that's not special enough for them. Um, and uh, I think that there are ways that we can do to make it work for us. And it, it, it's, it's really, for me, it's, it's providing the care. Um, it's great to have these animals that really need help. I have, you know, if you ask a veterinarian, for example, uh, what is one of the uh, dogs that you fear the most as far as aggression? And on that list, there are a lot of them. I mean, certainly we know that chihuahuas are land sharks, but but one of the the um, dogs that that is really just not a great dog, that's very one person or one family oriented, that loves to bite veterinarians, and that's the Chow Chow. Well, I have a rescue group that pulls, and if I tell you the Chows that she finds and pulls, not one, not two, but ninety percent of them 
actually read the Golden Retriever book by mistake. And they are the most amazing dogs. And to take these dogs and give them, you know, fix them, clean them, it's, it's amazing. You see these dogs. And it's, the dogs have seemed to appreciate it just as much. And um, I said, it, that's rewarding. I mean, that's why we do what we do. And when you see that and you see this owner who now has this fantastic dog, uh, it just it, it, it makes you feel good. And I think that's why I would encourage veterinarians to get involved. That's great. That's great. There's a personal aspect to it uh, that, that can be very rewarding. Um, so we're now ready for the Q&A uh, uh, part of our Hangout. Um, if you're part of our live audience, just um, press the Q&A icon in Google Plus or add a comment in YouTube. And uh, our moderators will get it in the queue. So our first question is less of a question and more of a heartfelt experience. The viewer says, I worked at a nonprofit vet clinic. Um, some veterinary facilities look at us as competition. However, we had clients that may not otherwise have had the opportunity to vaccinate or provide basic veterinary care for their pets. Um, thoughts on, um, I imagine this is not a very, uh, not an uncommon uh, thing that you hear. You know, we, I, I, we discussed this earlier and, and, it, and it's so true. And um, uh, you, they, I think it depends on the type of practice you have. I, I would say this, the greater the difference, and you have to think about this for a second, the greater the difference between the care and the facility and the service one provides to that type of service, the less likely it's gonna, that service is going to make a dent. Now, if you have a hospital that is kind of on the low cost side, it's a high volume, low cost practice, Right, and then so these clients, it's a different expectation that these clients already have. So to go to the one step lower and, and to an ASPCA or a, a shelter that is offering veterinary services, full care veterinary services, may not be as much of a, of, a, of a change, and they might be willing to do it. But you develop a client base that wouldn't that I'm glad, like mine, uh, they're not gonna they're not gonna look at that. I mean, they wouldn't want it for themselves. It's like I say, to a client considering the uh, a, a, low, a really low cost or a subsidized spay, as, as Jed would put it, um, if you were sick or if one of your kids was sick, would you want to go to Cedar sinai which is our big fancy hospital here, or would you want to go to the LA Free Clinic? There's your answer. So it's the same thing. Yeah, and I, uh, I agree with Jeff. I think that... You know, we our, our hospital in New York City provides care to um, uh, to pet owners in, in New York, and um, you know we have decided as an organization to provide a high level of care there, um, which kind of gets to back to what Jeff was saying. You know, the two ways that you can provide you know care at a low cost to the client, uh, or a low price to the client, I should say. One is to subsidize it with generous donors, or to provide a different level of care, and you know, we've chosen to provide a high level of care in New York City. We also uh, make sure that the people we're serving are the people who need our help. Um, we're not perfect at that by any means, and we we go through constant um, efforts to refine the way in which we identify those clients. Um, and the the folks who come in uh, and sit in our waiting room on 92nd Street are not the clients who are going to go to Jeff's practice. They they can't they they're not they can't afford it. Uh, they usually haven't gotten much or any veterinary care for their for their uh, pets, um, and that's who we want to serve. And so that comment, I feel for you. Um, I know how that feels. And at the same time, you know when you work for a nonprofit that is a mission related organization, you know, your 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 profit is the accomplishment of your mission. Um, take heart in that. If you're doing good work for the clients and patients that your organization has chosen to serve, then who cares what the other veterinarians think? You know, you're you're doing what you've set out to do, and you should be proud of that, no matter what the veterinary community thinks of you. Great. Thank you both. Um, our next question is for Jeff. Um, you mentioned that you think uh, spay-neuter clinics must be cutting some corners to keep costs low, but couldn't spay-neuter clinics cut back on costs through efficiencies and improved surgical skills based on the number of, the, of surgeries they're doing? Oh, absolutely. And, and um, I think that the, the, the word that uh, Jed used earlier, the subsidization versus the low cost, I think is great. 
Um, but I also know from uh, seeing some of these in operation, and I'm, it, it, it probably is not across the board, there are some efficiencies, if you will, in just how uh, packs are used, how um, uh, surgical grounds and uh, gra drapes are used, um, where there, there probably are some cost savings that are being uh, applied just in their day-to-day. -day. Not that it's bad. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's a, um, oh, I, and I forget the name of it. There's a, a, a web series on now uh, of, of surgeons that are in, in the you know, 30s and 40s, right? And they would go in there into a belly with no glove. No, uh, yeah. Is it, is it the end of the world? No. Uh, to change your gloves and not to change your gown and, and, and have them assembly line, that's fine. Uh, and it's going to help save money, which is, of course, what needs to be done. So I'm not saying it's, this is a bad thing, but I, I don't know if, if the – and are they using post-operative pain medication injectably for each animal? Are there, are, is every animal on surgical fluids? You know, if it is, great. If they can do that and charge what they do, all power. Um, right. But I would be very surprised if, uh, if they can without being subsidized. Ed, what do you think? I think that's I think that's right, Jeff. And I think a couple of things to add there. One is that the Association of Shelter Veterinarians published um, guidelines, standards for um, high quality, high volume spay neuter operations back in 2008. They're being revised, I understand, this year, and and hopefully they will be the updated version will be out next uh, next year in 2015. Those were published in JAVMA, um, and I can provide you a link, um, Christy, if you want. But you know, the, the guidelines are clear, and, you know, ASPCA and a lot of other animal welfare organizations um, want those standards to be held up. I mean, if you're going to be doing these uh, procedures, they need to be done at a certain quality, and you need to consider surgical technique, uh, pain medication, anesthesia in a, in a comprehensive way. And, um, you know, there are groups out there who are phenomenal at this. I mean, I know uh, Humane Alliance in North Carolina is an organization that trains um, yeah, veterinarians who are doing this um, as a uh, as a career. They also train private veterinarians um, in the techniques. And so, to the to the question, um, yes, actually, you know, high quality, high volume spay neuter. And I, I'm laughing because we're we're a, a business of acronyms, and that's one that you'll see. H Q H V S N <laughs> um, is something that has been around for a long time, and it's a very serious medical endeavor uh, that that there are lots of people out there who have thought long and hard about. And you can do um, high quality medicine in a very efficient way that that then leads things. Um, so it, it's possible to do these surgeries in a very efficient way. Uh, that from a medical standpoint is uh, achieves a, a suitable level of uh, care, in my opinion, and that's what the good groups are doing. You know, the good groups are out there doing not only uh, efficient sur uh, surgeries; they're also doing uh, you know high quality of medical service when they, they do these spay neuter procedures. So one thing a veterinarian could do is find out who those groups are that are adhering to those standards and refer when they have the opportunity to those organizations. That's correct. And, you know, Humane Alliance has a great web page. They also have, I think, more in the neighborhood of 130 clinics that they've trained around the, the country. And they, they train, you know, teams, the veterinarians, technicians, and client service folks um, in, in all aspects of high-quality, high-volume spay-neuter. But that's a, that's a great place to start. Yeah. But I think that's a good uh, suggestion, Christy, is that if you have one of those facilities in your community or if you have another group that's doing um, high-quality, high those are great groups to, um, to talk to about how that's accomplished. Great. Well, that is all the time we have for questions today. Um, this has been DVM 360's Google Hangout on Air on working with shelters. Uh, if you want to see this again or missed any part of it, you'll find it archived at dvm360.com slash shelter hangout, along with many other stories, articles, tools, and advice on working with shelters and rescues. Um, I'm Christy Reimer, again, editor of DVM 360 magazine. I'd like to say a big Thank you to our participants, Dr. Jeff Werber and Dr. Jed Rogers, and to all of you for watching and participating. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Thank you. Thank you.